Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Um, what, where I thought, because we're in a medical place here, this is a, you know, a beautiful facility and Alcoholics Anonymous is not the thing that called alcoholism a disease. It, it just didn't. In fact, if you look at our primary textbook, the big book, um, I don't have one here, but it, you know, if you've been in the program for a while, you, you may be happy to hear it's making a comeback. And in the, if you look in the big book, you won't find the word disease, but once, and that's where they say that it's a, a, that a spiritual disease. And, and it's talking really then about how resentments create all spiritual disease. But they didn't use the word disease for a reason. And that reason was that in 1939, when our big book was written, um, there was no nobody saying it was a disease. It was a moral weakness. They used to hide us in addicts and basements, and they would put us in asylums. And, uh, and we were, you know, basically for 250,000 years of human evolution, nobody had a solution for what we call alcoholism. And then in 1956, the American Medical Association uh, called alcoholism a disease because they have five criteria that make something a disease. The first part of which is that it, it's primary. It's not caused by something else. You know, like if you've ever had shingles, they're a the secondary disease. They're caused by um, chicken pox. You know, alcoholism is of and by itself a disease. It is primary. It's chronic. That means it resists treatment. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, and uh, <laughs> it's progressive. It's progressive whether you drink or you don't drink. If you're sitting out there 18 years sober and you think your alcoholism is progressing, I, I promise you, if you're not doing something to pump your spiritual condition above your alcoholism, one day it'll go, boop, hey, Bob, <laughs> who are you doing right now? I mean... There's a bunch of stuff that's wrong you need to deal with. You know, it's going gonna, it's gonna to call you. And so in Alcoholics Anonymous, we have meetings. People will say to me occasionally, you're 43, almost 44 years sober, 44 next week. And I couldn't stand up with the 44-year-olds. Do you hate the honesty in this thing? I hate it. <laughs> but people will say, Marty, there's 12 steps. Have you not figured them out yet? No, not so much. Because I, my truth keeps changing. And when my truth changes, then the way the steps looks change. The AA fairy goes in your book late at night and changes paragraphs. <laughs> of, it's true. The other thing that an, a disease has to be is symptomatic. And, and the, the medical society said it has to be symptomatic both physiologically. So you go to your doctor and they find that your liver has expanded and that your blood pressure is bad in your brain. And usually we're a thing called hypoglycemic. And, uh, and this is the medical side of it. But to be a disease, it also has to be able to be diagnosed from lifestyle. And, and this is the thing that our medical professionals are not so good at. And I blame amateur drinkers for it. <laughs> because those idiots are out running their cars into trees because they don't know how to close one eye when they're driving. You see what I'm saying here? <laughs> yeah. So they fill the hospital emergency rooms and they mistake them for us. You know, the real chronic suffering people. And... Um, you know, I, I, I think back in my own experience, I was, you know, many years ago, I had my, my first son, uh, Donovan, and, uh, you know, I was, as you probably aren't surprised, I was drunk. This is one of the symptoms of alcoholism, is, is that we have the ability to become more or less insanely drunk at the most inappropriate moment. Is that not, I mean, that's symptomatic of us. Uh, any little hard drinker would probably stay sober when Mama was going into contractions. I'd been drinking cheap beer and wine all day. And she went into contractions, and I was just lucky that the guy across the hall was kind enough to drive us to the hospital because I was, I was 
I had stopped drinking a couple of hours and I was going into withdrawal, which happens to me because my body converts to alcohol after a period of time. If you keep this up and the disease progresses, the mitochondria in your body, the energy cells in your body convert. They don't want food to create ATP. They want ethanol. It's easier to process. And all of a sudden, you've got all these kind of crazy cells in your body that say, and and the more you drink, the more you want, right? You're drunk, your glasses are gone, your teeth are missing, you're under the bed, and they say, what, can I help you? Get me a beer, you know, because that's what I need right now. And so uh, this guy's got us in the car. She is speaking in tongues. I have no idea what she's even saying anymore. Hurtful things. She... <laughs> like, I wish I would have married Gordy Redden back. Like, what? Now I'm going to be a father. You know, cheer up. <laughs> you know the story? The guy comes out of the storm cellar and the trees are flat. Everything's okay, Ma. I haven't had a drink for over four hours. We're going to be okay, you know? <laughs> this is back a number of years ago. The medical uh, the facility we went to, the maternity ward was on the fifth floor. And back in the day, men were not welcomed into the delivery of your own children. You sat in the waiting room and you waited. And then someone would come out and say, you know, congratulations. And so, on. so I'm sitting there and not only do I have substantial alcohol withdrawal going on in my body, I have postpartum diarrhea. <laughs> this is... <laughs> I very... I sympathize with the entire pregnancy. So I've got this... <laughs> terrible problem and it's building see and I can't see a bathroom because I got and a, a medical professional goes by who should have been able to diagnose me immediately as being an alcoholic but she mistaked me for one of these occasional drunks and I said excuse me you know how we are right you just pull yourself up after you've got puke all over the front of excuse me can you tell me where the bathroom is and her face just went like you know like mm. she said if you take the elevator Go down to the first floor, exit the elevator, go to your left, go down the hall to the right, there's a men's bathroom. I said, thank you, gone. Now, I don't know if you've ever tried to withdraw going up and down in a hospital elevator, you know, and you've got postpartum diarrhea, you've got dry heaves, you've got sweats, and she's having a baby somewhere, I'm pretty sure, it's kind of like on the outer side of everything that's happening to me, but... <laughs> Many hours goes by. This was, in the big book, Alcoholics Anonymous is described as pitiful, incomprehensible demoralization. Yeah, I was so, so sick. And then all of a sudden, as it starts to clear, I look across the waiting room and I look at the elevator and, oh, my God, there's a bathroom on every floor if you exit the elevator and you go to the left. I bet she was just messing with me, sending me up and down the elevator. <laughs> I'm so wrong. And, uh, you know, eventually we have the, the child is born. The doctor that delivered this baby, Dr. Michael, came out and said, Marty, it's a boy. And I was so happy. And, and I uh, was allowed to go see my wife. And then I phoned my buddies. Now, I, you got to understand, I've been drunk for maybe five days. I've done the God, if you can get me out of this prayer. I say to my buddy, it's a boy. He said, where do you want to meet? I'll bring the booze. And I was drunk again, missing for two days. Now, this is the, this is the incomprehensible part of it because this was a joyful event in my life. I would have loved to have participated in all of this. But the problem with me and alcohol is, is that once I start to drink, I can't control the amount I drink. And when I stop, my buddy goes into what the medical people call distress. <laughs> it looks like this. <laughs> so... <laughs> so um, Donovan was born Donovan is now 45 years old Donovan is sober 45 years because of you because you came out to our house for Thanksgiving and Christmas and scared the hell out of him that's why <laughs> he won't even take a chance on a drink so if you've got kids and you're worried about him it can go very right but the interesting thing was is another six months before I recovered in the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. It was another six months. And, uh, and you know, you hit new lows and things happen to you in that amount of time. I, you know, I, I was one of those people. I could not stay in a blackout. I kept coming out of blackouts. And this last 
uh, drunk I had, I would, I was coming in and out of, of the, the, you know, waking up in the morning and the bill describes the four horsemen going across the bed, you know, the, the, you know, the desperation and all of that stuff that you all know going across the bed and then the bits and pieces of the night before there was a gun there was a, a female breast not one of ours there was a, a gun there was a car chase there was cops uh and, I, and now i'm in bed i have no idea how i got home no idea i still have my suit on but i'm under the covers you know what i mean so this is this is alcoholism the phone is ringing in the distance and i'm thinking oh god oh my god it's probably the police you know i'm listening to see if she's still in the kitchen you know, this is the, the 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 frenetic mind of the alcoholic when you when you come to, and 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 I can hear I can hear her answering the phone. And she says, "Marty, it's your sister." And I thought, "Oh man, this is what I need, my sister." Like they train them somewhere, right? They got this question they ask, probing, invasive, <laughs> meddling question. How are you? <laughs> <laughs> I'm thinking, what are you getting at? What do you know? What have you, who have you been talking to? What have you seen? <laughs> and she says, would you, I, you, has it ever occurred to you, you might have a drinking problem? I said, no, I don't have a drinking problem. I drink better than anyone. I, I drink longer than everyone. She said, oh, you're an idiot. Would you talk to a man if I sent him over, a, a guy from Alcoholics Anonymous? And I thought, oh, great, I'm not in enough trouble. Now i got to help some guy from Alcoholics Anonymous. <sighs> it's the only time in my life I ever did the Elanon greeting. You know. So, Alcoholics Anonymous sent, sent him over. His, his name, he called himself Dwayne. It was many years... 15 or more years before I found out his real name because I saw they'd done a story on his life, actually two or three episodes called Shrek. And that's exactly what this guy looked like. Big, you know. And <laughs> we went to a thing called the A&W to have coffee. I'd ne Coffee. <laughs> Why? What, what did we, and then what are we going to do? And he said, well, we'll just talk. Why? So we go there and he's, and you know, there's, there's a, in the big book, Alcoholics Anonymous, there's a chapter called working with others, which apparently he had read. Cause it said, if your man's not very serious, you know, tell him a few humorous stories about yourself. <laughs> so Shrek starts telling these stories and I'm an alcoholic. <laughs> I've got to tell a worse story than any story. I believe, honestly, if you went to a meeting of AA and said you'd made love to a zebra, Somebody would say, well, at least the one you got was a female. You know what I mean? It's just, it's always, it's like one downsmanship, you know? Yeah. So uh, he tells a story. I tell a story. He tells a story. I tell a story. You know, I finish my fifth step and uh, <laughs> unbelievable. This guy got out of me everything I hadn't told anybody forever in two minutes. The book says one alcoholic talking to another. Right. And so and so what happened was that night he said, hey, you know, you've heard this one. Sounds to me like you get in a lot of trouble when you drink, but you don't get in trouble when you don't drink. Why don't you stop drinking? <laughs> one thought, I'm going to kill my sister. Not, oh, my God, there's help. Oh, my God, I'm going to be okay. none of that. Never crossed my mind. Just now this bozo knows where I live. He's got all kinds of evidence on me. And I'm in trouble. So he said, I'll pick you up for a me meeting in the morning. And I said, what kind of a meeting? He said, it's a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. He said, like, I can't say you're an alcoholic, but I think you should come and hear this. So I said, what time? He said, 10 o'clock. I'll pick you up at 10 o'clock. So I said, okay. So I left the house at 9. He's out front in the car waiting for me. See? And, uh, and he explains to me when I get in the car that once in a while here and there, a newcomer will try to escape. So you want to get there a little early. We go to the meeting and average age in the room, dead. These are old people. 40, 50-year-olds, old 
and they're they're talking about going up and down some stairs or something. I couldn't make out what they were. Somebody had got stuck apparently on the fifth stair. <laughs> And one of the really, really old ones said, if you don't get off that fifth stair, you're going to get drunk. And I thought, well, why don't we take the meeting over to the fifth stair? <laughs> because I listen better when I'm hammered, right? So anyway, the, the meeting went on forever, and they were drinking coffee. I had never seen anything like this. I, f I keep looking under the table for colostomies or bags or like, where the hell are they drinking all this coffee and why would you drink so much coffee <laughs> they're all talking at the same time they're laughing in impossibly stupid places one guy said he'd peed himself they killed themselves laughing <laughs> that's only funny if you've stopped peeing yourself you know that right <laughs> somebody's wife had come home and their kids had come and they all started crying. I'm going, oh my God. Like <laughs> one flew over the cuckoo's nest. You know what I mean? <laughs> the guy at the front says the most incredibly stupid thing I'd ever heard anybody ever say. He said, if you want what we have, <laughs> let me think, what have you got? Uh, you're really old. You can't drink. And you're obviously all mentally ill. So, let, no, I don't think... I'm good. I'm good. <laughs> Shrek is on fire. He, he, he's just fired up by this meeting. He's taken on a... He's, he's got his auras about out this far. We get out in the parking lot and he says, What did you think of that? <laughs> <laughs> so I'm new. I said, I loved it. I hated it. He said, That's good. I'll pick you up for another meeting tonight. I said, no, no, I don't want to go to any more meetings. Like if you, I was in the broadcasting business at the time. I said, if you want to come on my show and collect money or something, he said, oh, shut up. I said, excuse me, you can't tell me to shut up. He said, of course I can. You're an alcoholic. I said, wait a minute. You told me last night I'm not, you can't say I'm an alcoholic. He said, that was last night. <laughs> We hadn't, you hadn't been to a, normal people don't go to meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous, you idiot. <laughs> he had rigorous honesty, not rigorous, it was rigorous. And uh, he said, you know why we call it Alcoholics Anonymous, don't you? And I said, no. He said, because we're anonymous. <laughs> I said, okay. He said, yeah. So that means we're all over the place. You don't know who we are, and we're watching you. So. I said, that's illegal. He said, yes, it is. I said, I'll call the cops. He said, they're in on it. Oh. People sometimes say to me, you know, does, doesn't he get offended when you call him Shrek? I was speaking somewhere one day, and I go, oh, my God, Shrek's in the front row. And I look at his name tag, and it says Shrek on it. So, so I said to him, does it offend you when I call you Shrek? He says, have you watched the movie? I said, no. Well, yeah, I guess so. He said, yeah, Shrek's best friend is a jackass. He said, it's a perfect fit. <laughs> and so begrudgingly I entered the program of Alcoholics Anonymous and and he was the perfect sponsor for me because he realized he wasn't the perfect sponsor for me he just brought person after person after person trying to get somebody to connect with me and 90 days later I still didn't get it I did not get it I sat in meetings listening for everything that it was like going to a zoo to find animals you can't identify with I was not I did not want what you had in fact I wanted anything but what you had you know, like I remember it being in his, you know, 45 or 50 days sober. We were in, in, in Shrek's basement. He had a dog named Tinker that was so old it couldn't even bark anymore. Just kind of, whoa, whoa, like. <laughs> and there's, there's all these sober young drunks in this basement. And, and he would say, smile, Tinker. And, the dog, and they'd kill themselves laughing. I was thinking, oh, my God. <laughs> this is how it ends in Shrek's basement with Tinker. Oh my god. 
<laughs> Jesus, I, I had such potential. You know, I was gonna re- I was gonna be something, and now I'm gonna die with Tinker. <laughs> you know, the 90th day of my sobriety, I went into a room like this with about this many people, and there was a little guy from Florida. His name was Wesley Parrish, and some of you that have been around a while know who he is. If you haven't heard his, his CDs, get them. He was amazing. He was just a loving. He was a little wee guy. He's about four foot square, and he had a great big diamond ring and a motorhome, and I wanted what he had. <laughs> you know, and and he said to me, "You know what's wrong with you, boy?" Because he followed me out into the parking lot after the talk. He said, you got something so big inside of you and you're a chicken shit. (laughs) I thought Dwayne has been telling him stuff. (laughs) He said, you know, you, if you're going to come to Alcoholics Anonymous, he said, you're going to let something really big out into the world. And I thought, I'd like to, I kind of like to do that, you know. So I came on board. I joined Alcoholics Anonymous. And so a couple of years goes by. Now, this doctor that did, you know, go back into the story of my son's birth, this doctor that delivered my son had been my my doctor when I'd gone to university. He was the university um, uh, college um, sports team doctor and really reputable man. But again, AMA in 1958 defined alcoholism, but they don't get any training on what it looks like. So I'm going in there appointment after appointment, and he's saying, your blood pressure's through the roof. You know, I'm 18, 19, 20 years old, something like that. Uh, you know, like you've got uh, hypoglycemia. Uh, you've got, you know, your liver is expanding. Never once does he ask me if I drink. <laughs> I'm not going to bring it up. You know what I mean? So, because that's the only thing that I can do that I can do. And so he'd take me in his office after with these appointments, and we'd go into what I called the tickle trunk. Because I think he thought I had VD, you know, a Valium deficiency. And <laughs> he'd give me these big sacks of Valium. And it would, you could take them if you were anxious. You could take them if you thought you were going to be anxious. You could take them after you were anxious. <laughs> it said on them, you know, may, the effects may increase if you drink. So you could take them when you were drinking. You know, it was, that, I loved it. And and I didn't shake so much when I drank because I don't know about you, but when I come off at the end of my drinking, I had to put a tie around my neck to get a a a a beer to my mouth. And I, I, by the way, at this point, twenty three years old. That's right. I used to look like you, young people. (laughs) Just excessive good living has done this. I can't promise it for you. So anyway. I go into this, I, I get in a big fight with London Life, an insurance company in Canada, because they won't insure me because I put on my form that I, I was an alcoholic. And, and I have a big argument with them like we do, and I convince the president of London Life that they're, that, you know, if, if somebody has identified themselves as an alcoholic, that's a good thing. Insure them, put a rider on it that if their death is caused by anything related to drinking, your insurance is canceled. But the ones you should worry about are the ones that are the undeclared alcoholics. He said, fine, you go get a medical exam, and we will insure you. So I go back to Michael, my doctor. He examines me. He says, excuse me. And he's very cold with me. He leaves the room. He comes back. He looks at the files. He, I've done blood. I've done urine. He looks at all this. He does my heart. He does my pulse. He does everything. He says, excuse me. He leaves the room. He comes back, and he says, are you the Marty Jeffrey that used to come here a few years ago, I said, yeah. He said, what happened to you? I said, I quit drinking. He said, stopping drinking changed your blood pressure, changed your, the, you're not hypoglycemic anymore. Your liver, like I, all of this happened because you stopped drinking? I said, yes, I guess so. So he said, I need to talk to you in the office. Now, I'm at this point, I'm a couple of years sober, so I'm thinking, if he gives me the pills, do I take them? If I take them, do I sell them? If I don't take them, if I, if, I, if I take them and sell them, do I have to tell my sponsor? If I don't take them, maybe I won't tell my sponsor, but I'll just take them and I'll hide them. And, okay, you know. Yeah. One day at a time, baby. So we get in the room. Michael's now got his doctor coat off. And what I'm confronted with is a father. And he said, listen to me, if this can do that for you, would you please talk to my son? He said, he said, he, um, 
He's so drunk and he's so angry. The Valium doesn't work anymore. Nothing's working anymore. Can you talk to him? And I said, I would be so honored, Michael. I'd love to talk to him. In fact, I said in, a, in our program of Alcoholics Anonymous, we have a step that says we carry the message to still suffering alcoholics. I would be honored. He said, I'll get him to phone you at 630. I said, understand. He's got a wanna wanna. I can't make him wanna. But if you get, if I can get a hold of him, maybe I can give him some hope. Because that's what we're dying of, isn't it? Lack of hope. You know, they've done studies in the, in, in cognitive science now, right at the front of the brain, there's a sort of like a, an, an aviation flying machine test unit that we have so we can predict things, we can project things, and it's garbage in, garbage out, right? So sometimes we get some very bad answers when we're estimating things. But what's interesting is when this center shuts down or when we lose hope, the brain is absolutely incapable of creative thought. You can't think a creative thought. So when your newcomer is telling you, I don't know what I'm going to do, they're not joking with you. There is nothing. There's no doorway. It's hopeless. It's blackness. It's madness. So anyway, Michael says, uh, I'll, I'll talk to him. I'll get him to call you. At 6.30, the phone rings, and I say, hello, you know, expecting it to be this kid, and, and it's Michael, the doctor. And he says, uh, you don't have to talk to him. And I said, "He does. He's, does, he's not interested in getting sober? And he said, no, Marty, he... He decided he was going to get on his motorbike drunk and go across the Broadway Bridge, and he's dead. Wow. Like, no words. It was the first sober, real slap across the face I got. Because this thing kills on a regular basis. This thing is subtle and powerful and is patient and it will kill you if you're drinking or you're not drinking we we have we are incapable of controlling and enjoying our drinking bulletin we are incapable of controlling and enjoying our thinking so if you think that by some miracle of chemistry through the program or what they call in my group osmosis you know when you're sitting in your chair and all the truth comes up into the top of your brain <laughs> <laughs> if you think you're suddenly going to return to normal thoughts, ear, you know, it's not going to happen. <laughs> Dude. We have to go to meetings and listen to other people and go, that is so crazy. <laughs> oh my God, I was just thinking that. You know what I mean? <laughs> and so... I, I, I'm in the program of Alcoholics Anonymous, and I, and you know, I had one of those stories that I got sober when I was 23. By the time I was uh, 25, in those days, you know, there's the fellowship, and then there's the program of Alcoholics Anonymous, and the fellowship says some crazy stuff sometimes. You know, like don't think. Tough to do step three if you don't think. You know, but there's lots of stuff it says, and and some of it is quite profound, and some of it is just n nonsense, but one of the things they said when I came around was, you don't make any decisions like leaving your job or leaving your wife for two years, which was good, because every day I was leaving my wife. The nerve of her breathing in and out, in and out, <laughs> in and out. It was, it was just too much. <laughs> so, so what, what happens in Alcoholics Anonymous is that we start to adopt a, what, what they call a psychic change. I can feel, see, and think things like I've never been able to see, feel, and think things before. I have like a 180 change in my perspective. And it, it, and, and this, this, this flight simulator that I have in the front of my brain, I start putting principles. I feed principled m motion into that flight simulator, and I start getting good results, and I start getting good things start to happen to me. And, oh, my God, I get hope. You know, and I and I go to the meetings and and, uh, you know, the, the newcomers start to walk around you because you just, you know, it's like calm down, old man. You know, you're not that happy. And uh, but we are. We are because you start to make a conscious contact. You know, it, it says in the book and, and this is I'm just going to sum up with this is and this is what this talk is about is that we have been worshiping reason all of our lives. It says in the book that the God of reason, capital R, reason, has been what we've always we've always trusted and had faith in our thinking. <laughs> Why? 
You know, look at the record of your thinking. My, my best thinking ended me up in Alcoholics Anonymous, for God's sakes. You know what I'm saying? So here's, here's what we're doing in AA is we're, we're changing that we're going across the bridge of reason. So I always visualize this thing like the Golden Gate Bridge, just a massive bridge. Bill says it's a broad highway. A broad highway. And then there's the walker section, you know, on the bridge. This is where the slipper sliders and loafers all go. And they, they, they slip off the bridge regularly. But most of us are kind of in the middle of the bridge, trudging the bridge of reason, trying to get over to the shore of faith. And once you get into the shore of faith, you move out of the state of mind into a state of being. You, you have a state of being. You just, you just, one day you're just be sitting somewhere and all of a sudden you'll get a big stupid grin on your face because you just are, you just feel joy. And, and I can't explain that to you, but I promise you, if you stay with us, it'll happen. And, and you'll phone your sponsor and you say, am I losing my mind? I've been happy for two days. <laughs> yeah. Am I losing my mind? I don't hate everybody anymore, you know? I was just at Safeway, and there was a woman in front of me counting pennies, and I didn't scream. <laughs> Am I okay? Yes. <laughs> that is a normal reaction. So when, when we're on this, this bridge of reason going across the shore of faith, it says that, that we can see the outlines and the promises and everything that we want over in that state of, of being, but we, we can't get off the bridge. And Bill says, I think we can't get off the bridge because we've been leaning too much on reason that last mile. You know, we, we, you have to, at some point, you have to leap and you have to just say, I'm going to do the right thing and then I'm going to see what happens. Life becomes not so much about my expectations of what I'm putting into the, into the you know, the, 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 the grinder. And I say, if, if you all would do what I want, we would all be happy. Because what happened to me is the worst thing that happened to you in Alcoholics Anonymous. I got sober, I got busy, I got rich, and I got complacent. Because what happens when you, when you get everything you want, you find out a very bad thing. It all sucks. Yes, you have a swimming pool, and yes, you have four-car garage, and I had 13 cars, and they were all problems. Everything was a problem. My children were breathing in and out. She was there. It was a problem. Thoroughbred racehorses. I was buying a helicopter one day. It was a problem. Everything was a problem. Alcoholics Anonymous was this big in my life. I went to share, you know, because I owed it. And... uh <laughs> Somebody should have kicked me so hard in the crotch. But I was so full of myself, I didn't even know I was sick. I walked by a gay guy one time, and he said, there but for the grace of God goes God. Yes. <laughs> so, the, and the other thing that when I started to think about this bridge of reason, I realized that so, sort of like the relationship between Canada and USA, under Canada, there's all these states, you know, uh, Oregon and Washington and under the bridge of reason there's the states of mind like anxiety uh, entitlement a state of panic state of depression there's one big lake Lake Superior <laughs> <laughs> if you stay in Lake Superior you eventually have to swim to Fantasy Island you know <laughs> but I mean I was so locked into Lake Superior I didn't even know I was sick this is why we, if you don't go to meetings, you find out what happens to people that don't go to meetings. It's not that you'll get drunk necessarily. I did not. I had 28 years of what I call animal mechanical AA, which was doing what I had to because I had to, but I had failed to grow my spiritual experience. I'm going to say that again because we hear this at meetings all the time from the fellowship. It says that we, we are, our sobriety is contingent on maintenance of our spiritual condition. That's true. Later in the book, it says that we have to maintain and grow our spiritual experience. That's what I failed to do. At 28 years sober, I still had the same amount of understanding around this whole terrific creative power as I had when I come in the doors of Alcoholics Anonymous. It was too skinny. I was singing songs like How Great I Art. <laughs> Writing that book, I'm not much, but I'm all I think about. You know, when you have no God, this, this is a bumpy ride here in the physical dimension. 
And so what happens is we, we, we go through the steps and we, we get on the bridge and we go step one. Okay. I know I have an abnormal reaction to alcohol. I realize that my life's become unmanageable. I know I have a power. I need a power greater than myself. And you get to step three and you go, Oh my God, it's a trick. It's a toll bridge. And not only is it a toll, it's like a Florida toll bridge. You don't know what you have to pay till you get at the other end. <laughs> and it's, it's very, it's described in the book. It says there's a price that has to be paid. And that price is the total destruction of self-will. You say, well, what, wh- what do I do then? I'll be the hole in the donut. And Bill eloquently answers that when he says the proper use of the will is to ask for higher powers will. Okay, so I'm going to say that another way. Let's say that there's a consciousness that is so superior to ours that it already knows exactly how to do everything that I need to do. And so if I align myself with the it's kind of thinking, I will start to do more right things. That's closer. You can take all of the God stuff out of it if you want. And you can just say to yourself, is there an intelligence, a, a, a symmetry? I mean, atoms, it says in the big book, are smarter than thinking everything's just running around with no order. Look at the story of the Wright brothers. I love that story, right? Here's these two goofs from from uh, Ohio. They own a bicycle store. <laughs> About 14 days before they fly, there's a, a, an erudite professor, Professor Langley. He was re- revered in the United States of America. Your government had paid him money to learn how to do flight so that you guys could have the advantage in the air in war. They spent a ton of dough. He, he went out in the middle of the Potomac River. He put his flying machine up in the air and went, Vick. splash, and down it went. The guy almost drowned, and the newspapers in the morning reported, God does not want man to fly. Apparently, they didn't get that paper in Dayton, Ohio, because the Wright brothers, you know, Orville and his brother, decided that they were going to go to a place called Kitty Hawk. Now, let me tell you why. Because there's laws like gravity. You know, you, you might disagree with it, but I promise you, if you go to the top of this building, it will show you that it always works. If you're good or bad, little or young, cute or small, ugly or bad, you will fall. There's many laws like this. They're immutable laws. They're basics. And what the Wright brothers realized was if they were going to fly, they had to go to Kitty Hawk because the wind blows at about 35 miles an hour all the time there. And they could point their flying machine with this new engine that Bob, some idiot in their shop, had built a little engine that was light and had 12 horsepower. And they thought if they could get Bob's engine and a couple of rubber bands and head into the wind, they could get get off the ground. And they did. And what you realize is that principle is more powerful than intelligence. They took the principles of flight. They took the things that it needed, lift and glide and all those things, and they put those into a, a structure and lo and behold, they flew. This is no different than what happens to us in Alcoholics Anonymous. We, I, we, we apply laws and principles we don't really understand. And we start to have a kind of a flight where our lives become bigger than anything we would have imagined. We start to have friendships that we were absolutely incapable of. You know the bedevilments, right? Can't form personal relationships, can't control our emotional natures, right? Pray to misery and depression, You know, that's basically what was wrong with me, that whole list. And then what happened to me in Alcoholics Anonymous, and I was amazed before I was halfway through, was that all of a sudden I had personal relationships. And I found myself in situations where I would normally lose my stuff, like driving. And I realized, oh my God, I've fallen off the bridge of reason into the state of entitlement. Everybody's an idiot but me. I can break the speed laws, but they never should break the speed laws. I can cut people off, but they can't be cut people off. And merging? <laughs> God created people with no merging genes. This is what I'd come to. So driving the car for me was a scary experience for myself and everybody. 30 years sober, I'm And then one day, God said to me, you know what? Well, I actually said it to me. I had a stupid newcomer in the car. And we, I got cut off, and I went, I lost it. And I stopped the car, and he went, wow. <laughs> where'd that come from? And I thought, oh, my God, where did that come from? I, I didn't even see that coming. It was just like, cork. Rah! And I said to God, 
is it possible that I could come out of the state entitlement? Now, when you're coming out of these states, you kind of go through, you kind of got to go from one state to another. You go from state of entitlement to state of depression, state of depression, state of dep- despair. Then you go back into the uh, state of hopelessness and helplessness, and that's where the foot of the bridge is. You get back up onto the bridge. You do step one. I'm powerless over all the other people in the cars. Oh, my God. I'm powerless. My emotional nature is not helping this situation. What if what, my mother was the woman that was trying to merge in front of me? Would I be honking and doing all that stupid stuff to her? Or would I be trying to hold the other cars back so that she can get safely onto the highway? And in a, in a moment, my entire driving experience changed. In a moment, I found myself able to stand in lineups. You know, in a second, I found that I was not the most important person in the room. I remember one time I said to Shrek, I feel like people stare at me when I walk in a room. He said, you know, Marty, when you want to walk in a room, you would never believe how little they all care. (laughs) That was a very happy piece of news for me. And so Alcoholics Anonymous is this whole thing about getting you know, to the end. And people say, well, do you leave the Bridge of Reason? No, you go, you go into a state of being and then you come back and you get people at the start of the bridge and you get them over and you try and get them to jump into, into, the, into the state of being. And then you go back and you get some more and you do it over and over. But if you're not getting off the bridge at all, if all you're doing is going back and forward, back and forward, and all there is is reason and there's no relief, I'm going to tell you something. Meetings get to be a hard place to go. Newcomers, <laughs> I love the old guy saying, nobody ever talks to me anymore. I wonder why, you know. <laughs> we have a group called the Lions Group, and, and, we, and I'll tell you how bad it is in Alcoholics Anonymous. We had to create a position called a chaser. Because what had happened in Alcoholics Anonymous was we forgot that there are people there that don't get it. People there that are isolated, apart from, and different than, that aren't in our little AA family clique, all sitting around with every, like everybody does with BO, all in one area. You know, what did you do last night? I don't know. And there's a guy over here dying. Oh, I don't know. So we created this position called a chaser. And the chasers for one month agree that they will not visit at the end of the meeting. They'll just look and they'll see who's on the wall and then they go after them. If they see somebody head for the parking lot, they chase them. And they go in the parking lot and say, how'd you like the meeting? (laughs) You know. (laughs) You look like an idiot. I think you'd fit in our group. You know what I mean? Like, (laughs) we're the unwilling, led by the unknowing, going nowhere. Come and join us. You know, it's like... And then what we do, it's a miraculous thing. I heard it talked about at 903 this morning. We don't ask them for their number. I mean, I'm sorry, I don't give them my number. I ask them for their number. And then I phone them, and it's always the same. Hello? Oh, I guess I really am important. You know, they, they've called to make sure I'm coming to the meeting. And, you know, our membership, just our, our youth membership in Lions Group, we're over 65% now, uh, kids probably under the age of 25. And this is, um, yeah, well, listen... Uh, I was pretty arrogant until I saw what was going on in this room. This is a healthy group of people. This is a gr- I saw the newcomers. I saw the, uh, the long timers. I saw the middle members. Just all I can tell you is don't stop what you're doing. It doesn't matter what's going on in the world of politics. It doesn't matter what's going on in the world, period. One alcoholic carrying the message to another alcoholic. And use the book. It's interesting. People are saying, I think we should do it like the old timers, you know? And I tell them... <laughs> Just for a minute. It took them four years to get a hundred people together. You know, that's that's us on a bad meeting night. You know what I mean? Four years. Let's not do it like the founders. Let's do it like the founders learned how to do it. Because once they got that book into print, all of a sudden there was ten thousand and there was a hundred thousand, and we had a fellowship, the greatest, the greatest spiritual movement in the history of the world. Never been matched, never will be, and it's in your hands. God bless you, and thank you so much. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.